Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. Well, it's been quite a while since we were on this subject, but I have been quietly keeping an eye on the He Gets Us marketing campaign. It's been somewhat of a challenge because the people at He Gets Us are keen on changing the name of videos in order to appeal to the unwary customer. But, despite the confusion, here we are. Now, some of you may very well be eagerly waiting for biblical evaluation and a spirit of godly discernment on the matter. Others may be saying, eh, what's the deal? Are you hung up on He Gets Us? Well, allow me to confess that I and others take seriously what Christ and His Holy Spirit through His Word the Bible have already spoken and warned us about. For example, Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 through 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth, and wander off into myths. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. For such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day will many say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And finally, Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. These are just a few of the passages presented from God's Word to us, which are His clarion call warning. They tell us not just to be careful, but to expect deceit. More importantly, not just any deceit, but specifically deceit and lies centering around the person, nature, and identity of Jesus the Christ. We are to expect people, for whatever motives, to present a false Jesus, a false message about Jesus, or a false gospel. Moreover, we are told that the deception will be so cunning that, quote, if it were possible, even the elect will be deceived, unquote. To be blunt, this means that it is likely that well-known, well-respected people, even people with a title and a church, who have not truly been saved, can 
and likely will come forward to acknowledge and support error and deceit. There's no inoculation against deceit other than a genuine relationship with the true Jesus grounded in the sufficiency and totality of God's Word, the Bible, in context. To this, we can only add to and depend upon prayer and discernment given by the indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us in all truth in Christ. This being said, we are called as God's chosen elect to publicly call out and expose heresy and error and to proclaim the truth boldly. So, Keep in mind that at this point, we are around three years into this movement by He Gets Us. And I'm by no means the only one responding to their videos. What is most instructive is that the main issue is still the main issue. After all these videos and articles, after all of the feedback which they have received, they are still doing the same thing. At present, there is still no video, no article, no statement, no redaction, no clarification anywhere from He Gets Us that Jesus is God. I mean, just how long does it take to figure this out? How long do we have to wait? Yeah, that's what it feels like. Three years and counting, and now what do we have from He Gets Us? Jesus is some guy to identify with, and who identifies with us because of any one of a dozen superficial issues that a mere human named Jesus experienced and understood over 2,000 years ago. Well, with this in mind, let's look at the latest video from He Gets Us, entitled, at least for the time being, Priorities. In this 31-second video, the caption gives us a summary of the content, saying, quote, Jesus could have enjoyed wealth, power, and fame, but he rejected them all. Instead of seeking fulfillment through material goods or personal accolades, he found joy by investing in meaningful relationships with others. An inner richness that can't be measured in a bank account, unquote. Now, my guess is that in their rush to identify Jesus purposely as abandoning the rich 1%, and instead becoming part of the underclass poor, that he gets us is trying to continue to foster the idea that Jesus was a social justice warrior and activist, and to better pave the way for the notion that Jesus and Christianity are essentially socialist, if not communistic in nature. Do you think if I went with you, this wizard would give me some brains? Well... Now, it is true that Jesus voluntarily became 100% fully man or human and took the form of a servant. However, as stated, the altogether missing statement from He Gets Us is that Jesus was also 100% fully God at the same time. Without this, we have no basis by which man can be saved. I mean, since man cannot reach or attain unto God, it requires that God becomes fully man in the person of Jesus, who is also fully God, so that as God, Jesus can live out a life fully in keeping with the perfection of the attributes of God, which he, as God, possesses. 
having perfectly lived and pleasing God, God can then, as a man, voluntarily take all of our sin and imperfection upon himself and be slain on our behalf in our stead, so that those who place their faith in his completed work may, by God's grace, stand before God clothed in Christ's righteousness. But let's be clear. Jesus was with God from eternity and shares all glory, honor, majesty, as well as the riches of all eternity. As stated, he voluntarily humbled himself temporarily by becoming a man in order to serve to redeem us. He gets us states that, quote, he found joy by investing in meaningful relationships with others, unquote. Well, this is also true, but the fact is that Jesus is not seeking meaningful relationships with everyone universally. No, Jesus came to seek and to save his own. Jesus is only going to establish a relationship as Lord and Savior with those whom the Father sovereignly calls and chooses as his elect. And this is why it is so critical to understand that the primary basis for true Christian joy is not simply superficial similarities between a guy named Jesus and any other human. I mean, the fact that we both start out as babies, eat, sleep, get tired, get lonely, get hungry, cry, laugh, are poor, rich, etc., are not the basis of Christian joy, and they certainly do nothing to affect our salvation. Unfortunately, the actual video continues to embellish their sophistry of Jesus' identity. The black and white still shots accompanied by a campy guitar music score give us the following voiceover saying, quote, Jesus didn't go to college, never asked for a raise. He didn't wear fancy shoes and never took out a mortgage. His friends didn't belong to a country club. His parents didn't have a will. So he worked hard and invested wisely, not in stocks or bonds, but in others, unquote. The video then ends with a sentence written mid-screen reading, quote, Jesus was rich, unquote. Penalty, too much baloney on the field. So here, I cannot help but be confused by he gets us. It, it sounds as if he gets us is suggesting that I and everyone else can feel good or at least feel better about ourselves if we have a lot of people who we can call quote unquote friends. In fact, it sounds as if I'm supposed to evaluate my life on the number of friends that I have rather than having an education, fancy shoes, getting a raise, having a mortgage, or belonging to a country club. Uh, if I have more friends than material substance, then, hey, I'm quote-unquote rich. And the more friends I have and the less substance I possess, the richer I am. Well... Okay, again, on the basis of Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16 and other passages, I would agree that primary concern in citizenship as Christians should be focused on God, his kingdom, his will, and not our own temporal comforts. And we could extend that to the fellowship with like-minded saints who are also in Christ. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 says this, quote, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, 
and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city." Unquote. So, yeah, wealth and material possessions are not the definition of quote-unquote riches in God's dictionary. Okay, but what about the quote-unquote friends? Am I rich simply because I have 3,000 quote-unquote friends on Facebook which I have never met? Is, is Jesus running feverishly around, begging everyone and anyone to please be his friend? <coughs> Were any of Jesus' disciples losing sleep over people refusing to be their friends? <coughs> what does Jesus actually say about quote-unquote friends? Well... First of all, Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 14, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. In John chapter 15, verse 19, Jesus says, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. James chapter 4 verse 4 states, Adulterers and adulteresses do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So, contrary to he gets us and their cotton candy parody of Christianity, when we stop using words fast and loose and start using biblical definitions, we see that the biblical definition of a friend is very different from the secular definition. I love you, you love me. Yes, instead of being friends with the world, we see that the correct focus is to be a friend of God, which is the kind of friendship that Christians should be interested in first and foremost. And as Jesus points out above, friendship with God is contrary and polarized to being friends with the unregenerate, the world, sin, and rebellion. You can bend over backwards, give up everything to be friends with the entire world, and if you're not reconciled to God, you are still at enmity with God. We are without reconciliation to God, and we will spend eternity in hell. So, let's again be clear. He gets us is applauding Jesus for preferring friends over material riches. By extension, they are suggesting that we should do likewise in order to follow Jesus' example. But, we can also be clear in reminding everyone that the only ones in history who qualified then or now as Jesus' quote-unquote friends were and are those who have entered into a relationship with him and acknowledge and confess Jesus as Lord, God, and Savior. Secondly, Jesus commands that we who are his friends 
should go forth and proclaim the message of his identity as Messiah, King, Lord, God, and Savior, and not simply some really cool guy who wants to friend me on Facebook. Thirdly, Jesus wants us to do what he did in his lifetime, which is to call people to repentance. We need to lovingly tell people to stop sinning, turn from it, to confess it to God as sin, and to follow Jesus. This is the problem. He gets us is failing and or refusing to do what Jesus has commanded us to do. They ignore or deny his deity as God. They fail to point out correct definitions in order to prefer bland, superficial, and anti-biblical definitions. And they never mention sin and or the need for repentance from it. Moving on, the next video is at present actually two separate videos bearing the same name of Unconditional. Both videos share some of the same material, which largely deals with parents who have or are dealing with children with various physical and or mental challenges. The common connection is that all of these parents and or relationships uh, being depicted are driven by love and sacrifice, which we are told by He Gets Us is the same quote-unquote love that Jesus exhibited toward mankind. Now, as with so many other videos from He Gets Us, the writers just love as a technique to attach as much emotion as is possible to their presentations as a method by which to move people to embrace their version of Jesus and who they think he is because of the emotional appeal rather than an actual biblical fact. The deeper the emotion, the greater we are intended to be moved to associate with the Jesus they present. So, in order to fully and fairly represent the Jesus of He Gets Us, let me set the mood as I quote He Gets Us from their own synopsis of Unconditional. Quote, Love is a complex word. From the feelings we have as a child for a parent, to the first spark of romance as an adolescent, to the deep respect and admiration for a lifelong friend. Love has many meanings. So how can we describe Jesus' love? The word that comes closest is probably agape an ancient Greek word that represents the highest form of charity or the love of God for humankind and vice versa. Jesus demonstrated agape love through the acts of selflessness, kindness and service, never expecting anything in return." Unquote. Well, here again, he gets us inadvertently exposes their secular understanding of a universalistic God where everyone ever born was, is, and will be Jesus' quote-unquote friend. I think I'm going to be sick. I'll to be fair, they do finally say that insofar as the Greek word quote-unquote agape is connected, that its definition is, quote, the highest form of charity or the love of God for humankind and vice versa, unquote. However, there are two problems with their definition. One, it's not clear whether or not because Jesus is exhibiting agape love that Jesus is, in fact, God. 
Uh, my educated guess is that because he gets us has inserted the words quote unquote vice versa within their definition that they assume or believe that man, any man in our finite fallen state are equally capable of exhibiting the same kind of self-sacrificial agape love that God, in the person of Jesus, exhibited on the cross. I don't think so! I'm sorry, but if that were possible, then Jesus would not have had to gone to the cross. We could have counted instead on some other equally self-sacrificial finite human to do it for him. No, the fact is that only Jesus, who is God, can show the kind of agape love which is actually effectual towards man in terms of salvation. Secondly, while Jesus' act of agape love shown in his propitiatory sacrifice may have been sufficient for all sin, it was and is only efficient for those within mankind who are called and elected to receive it according to God's sovereign will. If everyone was receiving it, then there would never be any goats, no chaff, and no one in hell. Everyone would instead be saved. But this is not the case because Jesus declares that there will be those to whom he says, quote, get away from me, I never knew you, unquote. Now, if Jesus is God, then Jesus is omniscient. He knows all things. If Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, and was the agent of creation, co-equal, co-eternal, co-glorious, etc., then the fact that Jesus, who is eternal, can say, quote, I never knew you, unquote, means that because he is God, he knew from eternity who is and who is not going to be one of his elect. Finally, he gets us, says that regarding Jesus' agape love, that Jesus demonstrated his love, quote, never expecting anything in return, unquote. <coughs> no, read your Bible. It's called the plan of salvation. Hello? Hey. Hello, anybody home? Huh? Think, McFly, think. Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So not only was there a plan and an expectation from the very beginning, there was an accomplished fact of history set in stone, determined by the sovereign will and unchangeable purpose of God for his eternal glory. To put it simply, the plan, the expectation, the purpose, and the will of God was to create and establish a relationship with his creation, man, whereby those who are the elect of God's creation might truly learn, know, and experience all of God's attributes in their fullest, and because of the goodness of his hand upon our unworthy lives, we might, by his grace, receive the gift of adoption to be his sons and daughters and to give him glory and honor forever. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, describes Jesus' mission and the quote-unquote expectation this way. Quote, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross." Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, 
every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Unquote. Insofar as the videos are concerned, it is difficult to rationally discuss the errant theology which pervades He Gets Us without getting confused into people believing that the arguments relate to people with disabilities, children and or their parents dealing with the effects of a fallen creation. My heart goes out to them and my prayers are with them and it's a shame to see any people getting caught up innocently or otherwise into being used as a part of the confusion being presented by He Gets Us. You see, as stated, Jesus, who is God, came to earth, lived, suffered, died, and rose again because of his agape love for his church, his bride, the outcalled ones, the elect, his children, the sheep. Jesus came to save and deliver his own from sin, separation, death, and hell. He did not come simply to relate or to be relatable. The trouble with making the correlation that Jesus is quote-unquote loving and quote-unquote accepting the entire world in the same way that many parents love and accept their children regardless of the situation is that this parody incorrectly paints the universalistic notion that Jesus, who is God, loves everyone regardless of their sin and rebellion. But the truth is that Jesus, who is God, hates sin and rebellion. Now, if, by God's grace, by God's power, we are, through Christ, able to place our nature of sin and rebellion to death on the cross with him, we are able to repent and turn from our sin and rebellion by his power and have the desire to live for Christ and not to ourselves, then we are Jesus' children, and he does love and forgive us. If, however, we remain in our sin, despite going to church, despite calling ourselves quote-unquote Christians, and despite having a Bible and reading it, then we are not his children, and Jesus does not know us. So, here is my counsel and suggestion to He Gets Us. Fire all of the secular, worldly, social justice warrior activists who are involved in your program. Simply ask every single employee or volunteer one question. Who do you say that Jesus is? If they cannot unequivocally say with assurance that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and God of very God, who lived, was crucified, was buried, rose again the third day, ascended to the Father, and is coming soon again to judge the living and the dead, then fire them immediately. Then go look for qualified men and women who have boldly proclaimed and continue to proclaim the above statement and who bear fruit in their lives accordingly. Until then, stop making watered-down secular statements about Jesus which deceive people into thinking Jesus is a social justice warrior and an all-around likable guy instead of God. The unavoidable truth and reality is that Jesus' identity is critical. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus declares, quote, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, unquote. This means that there are not many ways. There are not many methods. It's not whatever floats your boat and whatever your opinion is. There is only 
one way, one method, one truth, one reality. That way, method, truth, and reality is only Jesus. We also know, according to where we started, that Satan, the world, and many others will, according to Jesus, attempt to deceive as many as possible into believing in and following false Christs. So it is of eternal consequence that we know who Jesus really is. In keeping with this, we have to seriously ask why a biblically correct presentation on Jesus, which is now three years old or more, would not repeatedly make it crystal clear that Jesus is God and that salvation and true joy are contingent on a personal relationship with Jesus based on that conviction and faith. Instead, all we get are videos on personal, economic, and social relatability with a humanistic Jesus as an assurance that we are in the same boat, whatever that means. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 perhaps concludes the matter of the latter day's deception mentioned above best. Quote, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies Jesus is the Christ? He is an antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as has been taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children... Abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. For the time being, this concludes this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening.